Welcome to Brand New Taste, a podcast for brands in the food and beverage industry, focusing on new innovation and how understanding taste is vital to commercial success. Your hosts are Brant Mabry and Micah Carhill, co-founders of the leading development agency, Tastehead. So, Micah, hello. episode one, here we are. Indeed we are, yes. Very excited. I can see you're struggling to contain your excitement. Well, you know what I'm like. I'm a... Very excitable. Very excitable, Indeed. like a little puppy. Indeed. Yeah. It's fair to say we've been talking about doing this for a while. We've even been attempting to do it for a while. I'm not going to say which attempt number this is exactly. No. But here we are. We wanted to wait until we felt we were in a position where we could do it well, do it properly, yeah. keep it going. And so after five years of working together at Taste Ed, we think now is the time. Should we uh, say thank you to someone first? We probably should. Nat, who is a lovely voice that you'd have just heard introducing this episode and future episodes. Nat's our business development manager. Bit of a legend. Very much so, yeah. So thank you, Nat. Really appreciate you helping us out with that. We should probably introduce ourselves next. That is a very good idea. Um, I'm glad you said that. Okay. So I am Brant, co-founder and managing director of Tasted. A bit about my background. I was a chef for many years, uh, entered the world of product development as a development chef at a number of bakery sites, started working at Green and Black's Chocolate in 2013. So I had the pleasure of meeting you, Micah. Uh, and since then, we started Tasted, the food and beverage development agency in 2017. How about you? So I'm Micah. I am development director and co-founder of Tasted. I actually started in the wine industry many years ago. I got my diploma, WSET, um, and still love wine, but I had sort of an epiphany and I got really into food science, so I did a degree in that. And then since then, I've been in food development from New Covent Garden Soup Company through Whole Earth Foods, Green and Blacks, Course and Press, who I still work for. And Taste Head, obviously, we set up five years ago, which yeah. was all your pleasure. Yeah, an interesting ride it's been. Indeed. So should we perhaps just explain what our podcast is going to be about as well, just as this is the first episode, kind of tee up what to expect from us? Yeah, so, I mean, we're going to be talking about what we do. We, we, mm. we do innovation in the food and beverage industry. Um, and we're, tr we're going to give our sort of expertise and our learnings over the last five years, and more than last five, last five years at Tasted, but the last... I don't know how many years, 30 years for me in, wine, in food and wine, and, and similar for you. Um, not 30 years. Not 30 years I'm not, for I'm not you. I'm not seasoned professional. No, you're, you you're a young man. Yes. Yes. Um, but that's what we're going to do in this podcast. But what are we going to do in this episode? What are we going to kick off with, Brant? Yeah. So this episode, we are going to focus on taste. Because with what you said, very much we are going to be talking about innovation. That's the heart of what we do. But I think it's fair to say that we feel we have quite a unique insight and expertise in that we are product developers, we work in innovation, we've both worked as part of marketing teams at Green and Blacks and yourself, of course, and Press. Yeah. So we have quite a lot of marketing experience. And also, the reason we clicked so well together when we started working at Green and Blacks was because we are genuinely passionate about taste. It sounds daft, but there are so many product developers and food scientists who you see what they do outside of work it wouldn't sort of you know give you the impression that they do genuinely care about well about it's more i suppose it's not their passion as well necessarily sure, and there's sure. nothing wrong with that they might be into golf or um collecting little ornaments or something <laughs> but what we do or well yeah we we do when we're outside uh working in food and drink is that we just consume or we make it and cook it yeah and we you know it's, and we're, it's, we're oh obsessed my. about taste yeah we, we're not really interested in style over substance if we go to a restaurant it's nice having a foam of something and a twill of something else but you and i very much aligned on it's got to be delicious exactly. it's got to be moorish and in the product the retail product sector that is often missed or overlooked. And it's why we feel we've had the success that we have because we've worked with marketing teams and sales teams to bridge the gap, I guess, between innovation 
marketing and, and taste sort of running throughout that. So this episode is very much going to focus on that. So Bram, why is taste such an important factor in innovation? What are we trying to sort of achieve in this episode? Well, you would hope that it's fairly obvious that taste is one of, if not the most important factor of any food or beverage product, especially when it comes to repeat purchase. Your branding and packaging is going to do the hard work of getting that initial sale. But if you want people to come back to try the product again and again, your taste has got to be where it, you know, at, at least at expectations or obviously yeah, exceed higher, expectations, yeah. of course. I mean, I'm, I'm always, this is the case. You see something, a, a, a brightly packaged new food or drink happens to me all the time. Crisps, particularly. I see a new snack. I buy it. And, you know, if it, if it doesn't perform, then that's the last time I buy it. But there are a few that I go back to again and again. Yeah. And given that that's the case, it then surprises us that a lot of people in the industry who are the decision makers as to which product get launched, gets launched, which recipe gets signed off, don't have the training. They might be marketeers, it might be the founder of a brand. And so I think what we want to try and achieve with this episode is to offer our insights, how we approach taste throughout the innovation process and hopefully empower people to have more confidence. I think that's the key thing for, for, for me. How often do you go into a tasting session and someone says, oh, just to let you know, I'm not very good at tasting. And usually it's nonsense. They're usually plenty capable of being able to taste things effectively. It's just that they don't have the training. They don't have an approach. I think we see an over-reliance on focus groups and yeah. consumer testing, which isn't always a great idea. No, I agree. I mean, obviously, you know, the consumer groups, they're not trained tasters. Um, and, and what that means is they can give misleading results or results that, that are relevant to a certain degree, but you should never make a decision wholly based on that. And, and, you know, I think the other thing that is important is when new starters start in a company, in my experience, whether it's Taste Said or, or Corson or, or in the past in Green and Blacks, get those new starts in and give them a, a, a quite a brief tasting in, in yeah. a way about the, that, that product, get them to know that product. Yeah. And why it tastes like that. Now, you've got to repeat this process. It's not a one-off, but that is really important. Yeah. I think the sales teams in particular, we've spent a lot of time with sales teams educating them because they're in a position where they've got to sell this product in, literally, to the trade, to their key customers. And they often don't know where to start because they're not given materials. They're not given any training. And so they don't have the confidence. And as soon as they do we've just had so much good feedback over the years of they feel empowered and feel that it really helps to, you know, give them an edge, make exactly. a bit of difference. I mean, they can, they might have sheets that sell sheets that say, you know, this product has these sorts of tastes and so forth, but unless they're doing it with someone who has expertise in it and they can ask questions about it as well, that is, I think, really important. So, where do we start then, Micah? What's the first topic that we are going to dive into with this? So the first one we're going to dive into is taste versus flavour. Surely so, they're the same thing, Micah. Well, it's funny you should say that because <laughs> they're not. <laughs> um, a lot of people will talk about the taste of something and, and that is an all-encompassing word or phrase or, that does mean both taste and flavour often. But when you strip them down, taste is about what's on the palate. So salt, sweet, bitter, acid, umami, which is the savoury taste. Then everything else that we perceive is actually an aroma or a flavour. Now, we used to do this thing so often at Green and Blacks, didn't we? I mean... The pinch your nose trick. Exactly. Yeah, uh, hundreds of times, if not thousands. Um, if you want to try this whilst listening to the podcast, pause the episode here, go and get a piece of chocolate or, or a packet of crisps or a biscuit or, or anything at all and join in because what we do is we ask people to take a sample and let's, let's use chocolate as the example let's 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 use white chocolate yeah um which is often seen as being boring not having much flavor etc so it's a good example of why to use this pinch your nose place the chocolate into your mouth and start to eat it and and see what you can detect i think it's important to say please keep breathing through your mouth while you're eating yeah 
I think it's really important that people don't pass out. Yeah. Listen to the rest of the episode. Yeah, otherwise they just don't remember it. They so, won't. yeah. Uh, and as you're eating the chocolate, see what you can taste. Now, if you've got your nose pinched properly, you should be able to detect that it's sweet. But you shouldn't really be getting much else. You kind of get that it's creamy, but that's more of a sort of a texture thing. And it's when you ask people to release their nose and take a deep breath, you get this sudden wave of Madagascan vanilla, some very light caramelization notes from how the chocolate's made, even potentially some delicate notes from the cocoa butter. And that's because taste is what's detected on the tongue, which is your five tastes, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. And flavor is detected by the olfactory gland in the nasal passage so when you're eating your foods and chewing them in your mouth these volatile compounds are going up through the back of your throat into your nasal cavity and it's giving you the perception that you're tasting them in your mouth but it's actually linked to your sense of smell i did exactly that trick on the martha stewart show in the u.s i remember yes and i tell you what i wowed everyone of course the other thing that some people might have heard of the phrase, which is super tasters, mm. you know, what are super tasters? Are they great tasters? I wouldn't want to be a super taster. Explain why. Because the only difference with a super taster is the sensitivity to bitterness. So it doesn't mean that you're any better at tasting. I love bitter. Yeah, does that mean so I'm not a super taster? I think it does. Lucky for you. Okay. So... Yes, you want to ideally not be a super taster because it's, there's nothing particularly super about being more sensitive to bitter. And does that make does a super taster make a good objective taster then? No, because they do not represent the majority of the population. Yeah, so it's a bit misleading. Very much so. Not Should so super tasters. Not so super rubbish tasters. Let's call them. <laughs> Should we name them? Absolutely. And following on from that, do you want to explain the difference, Micah, of why? understanding the difference between taste and flavor is so important i i think it's so important to understand the difference so when you're um, tasting something and when we're developing something you can sort of split them up and you can look at them differently the reason why you need to do that is that you need to balance them so you need to balance the tastes so that the, the the salt sweet bitter if you have all those, the acid, if you've got it, sometimes you might even have umami. Don't always have all, all five tastes there. Mm. Um, and it's always good to get those right because they're the sort of structure, the base of it. But then you've got the flavours. So, for instance, if you've got, especially if you've got more than one flavour, you want, want to balance those so one doesn't dominate. And then once you've got those, I mean, you sort of do this all at the same time, but it's, it's worth understanding how you how you almost need to separate them in your mind because then you've got the taste and the flavors and you need those to balance as well so you need yeah. the taste to balance the flavors to balance and everything to balance together and really for me that's the key for a food or drink being moorish for it to be delicious it's having what makes your mouth water is that balance of sweetness and acidity and i've just seen it especially when i was a chef years ago in restaurants you would see people developing recipes creating dishes and if they weren't quite happy enough with the with the with the taste uh, they would think the answer is oh, let's throw in some more herbs let's throw in some more spices and just keep adding flavor and actually more often than not you end up with these convoluted recipes that just get a bit confusing and, and weird and it's just it's all about balancing the taste the flavor all together that's when food becomes delicious yeah i mean so how often do we say to people right you need to add a bit more salt mm. you need to add some acidity and that might be a bit of vinegar it might be a bit of lemon juice mm. it might be you know if you don't want the flavor it might just be a bit of citric acid or malic acid or something like that but yeah this is so the, the type of acidity yeah, that's a big so one. important yeah, yeah, yeah so there's, there's there's a lot to unpack here we won't be able to get in, in, into all of it a but... good example i think mm. of um something that is is arguably imbalanced when it's in a in a good state and where it goes out of balance is something like coke mm -hmm. so now coke is pretty sweet but it has quite a lot of acidity there it has you know it has the, the acidity that's added to it anyway but it also has the carbonic acid which comes from the addition of carbon dioxide so you've got that balance of sweetness and acidity and and the caramel flavors and and the, the sort of spice and so forth now if you let that coke go flat you're losing the carbonic acid because as the carbon dioxide dissipates you get that uh, lack of um or that that lower or higher no lower city 
higher pH. And so what happens there? It just te- seems overly sweet. Mm. You I mean, lose that bite. Exactly. And I think everyone can relate to how different fizzy Coke versus flat Coke tastes. So that's exactly. a classic example of nothing really changes with the flavour, no. but the change in the taste makes something very nice, a bit sweet, but still nice. I do like a red Coke now and again. Has to be the red Coke. Yeah, red Coke man. I like to call it proper Coke. Yeah. So it, it, it takes that from being very nice to something that most people just would not drink when it's flat. It's such a big change. I think another good example, uh, in if you take something like confectionery and you're developing a lemon candy or a lemon gum, gummy, we worked on the Tasty Mates yeah. uh, project recently. And a big part of that was making sure you had the acidity there for these fruity flavors. And it's got to be the correct sort of amount of acidity, the correct type of acidity. Otherwise, when you get fruit flavors, if you take something like lemon, let's say, you could have the best Sicilian lemon oil in the world that's got these pithy notes, these zesty notes, the fruity notes. If it's not got the acidity there, it just doesn't come to life. It almost seems artificial and quite unpleasant, really. Yeah, and you need citric acid in that sense because it's a yeah. citrus fruit. If you had something like uh, an apple or, or rhubarb, you'd use malic acid because that's the driving acid naturally in that fruit. Mm. If you put the wrong acidity in, it tastes a bit weird. And you, Sometimes you don't know why it tastes weird, but that's the reason why. You've got to use the natural acidity that occurs with that fruit or, or whatever it yeah. is. Yeah, you, you often see people just add citric acid to everything, but there's so many other acids to look at. Yeah. And sometimes it's a combination as well, yeah, as course. it naturally is in exactly. the fruit. Yeah. You're listening to Brand New Taste. Your hosts are Micah Carhill, food scientist, product developer, and taste expert, who has held the position of head of taste at premium brands Green and Blacks and Corston Press. And Brant Maybury, development chef, taste specialist, and managing director of Tastehead, leading innovation projects for brands of all sizes. So we've got taste, we've got flavours. It's fair to say there is something else as well called trigeminal effects. This is the heat of chilli, the heat of ginger, the cooling effect of mint. These aren't tastes or flavours. They're detected by the trigeminal nerve in your mouth and they're equally important. Um, the burn of alcohol. The burn of alcohol is a oh, very good example. One of that my favourite. It, it's why in the low and no alcohol category, it's it's... Beers are pretty good. I think wines and cocktails are getting better, but into the spirit side of things, there's some products there that are kind of best in class, but they're still so far away from an actual whiskey or a gin. And it's like, how do you replicate that yeah. bite? That, that's such it's an important burn, But part. it's also, it gives it a weight as well. Mm. Like sugar gives mm. weight to a drink. So it's, it, it does these things that are are textures in the mouth as well mm, mm. as trigeminal effects. Yeah, and and you see people will try to replace them, the 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 burn of alcohol with pepper yeah. or ginger or chili, and it's not the same not really. Same. They're accumulative the the the, the ginger and the chili etc. and and they tend to build as well on the palate as you're eating them and over time they increase as well whereas alcohol it's that sudden burn that then dissipates yeah another one that's always interesting is tannins Mm. which you know is that puckering in the mouth it's astringency it's a drying effect obviously you get it with tea you get it with red wine chocolate uh, chocolate um but often people get that confused with um sometimes acidity they call it sometimes they call it bitterness so it's good to understand these different flavors this is what we're trying to uh, hopefully get across is understanding the difference between them yeah, and some of these things like astringency might sound like they're, they're, they're bad things and they can be if there's too much of them, but actually for a lot of products, you want a certain amount of them Cuts to be Cuts through, there. doesn't it? Exactly, balanced. So now we have all these insights into what's going on with all our senses, what's, what's going to happen next? I mean, let's imagine the listener is either joining a tasting or even putting a tasting together. Where are they going to start? First of all, you need a plan. You don't want to be going into a tasting session cold. And I don't just mean putting a jumper on. I mean, have a plan. Sit down and think about, have some clear objectives. What is it that you're looking for? Now, first of all, why are you doing the tasting session? Is it for new product development? Is it existing product development? Is it quality control? Is it benchmarking? There's lots of different reasons why you might be having a tasting session. 
once you've identified that, what is it that you're tasting in terms of the category? Every product will typically have flaws that are unique to that category. So in chocolate, it could be improper roasting or fermentation. And that for quality control is very important, knowing the flaws. Absolutely, yeah. In coffee, it could be over-roasting of the beans. In bakery, it could be um, too much raising agent giving soapiness. So depending on the products, you'll have flaws that you want to be aware of and to look out for. So identify those, first of all. Once you've identified the flaws, you then want to look at what are the other focal points? What, what are the key elements of this product that you, you want to assess and are going to ultimately impact the enjoyability of the product? So is it, going back to bakery, is it how much of the Maillard reaction is there mm. in terms of those lovely baked notes that you'd get on a biscuit or a loaf of bread? Is it the balance of acidity and sweetness? Is that going to be important? Is it having the flavors that you've added into something make sure that that they're not overpowering so let's say you're doing a, a beverage that's got sort of natural fruit fruit juices in and so on and you want to just add some natural flavorings flavorings in to round things off you want to make sure that they're in balance so all of these things are elements that you can identify before you go into a tasting session and just by having them written down before you go in you're going in primed you know what you're looking for and i just think that action alone actually gives people quite a lot of confidence yeah and it also it, it helps you um, rem- reminds you of certain phrases or what you're looking for i remember we did this a lot in chocolate because chocolate is one of the most complex foods flavor wise over 600 different flavor compounds exactly and now you don't have a list of 600 um <laughs> flavor compounds or flavorings or whatever but you will have some really distinct ones and they're often categorized in things like dairy notes and and chocolate notes and um it might be earthy notes and Mm. uh, you know they can be separated out so when you're tasting a chocolate you can very much sort of focus in on those and have that almost not a cheat sheet but but just to remind you what's in that whereas like you say for something like um a biscuit you can have mild reactions and you're going to have maybe salt because salt's so important in baking you know yeah, yeah. and you know things like that so yeah really important yeah so you identify all of the elements you want to focus on see if they need to be weighted you know you'll score these attributes se- separately you might want to weight the scoring because some are more important than others the setup of the room as well is important you don't want to be distracted by um, heavy aromas so no aftershave or perfumes you love it when people come in with a fresh hot mug of coffee before all, a tasting all the session. time I, the amount of times i've said right we've got a tasting in in 10 minutes and they say oh I'll just go make myself a cup of coffee and i'm like well why would you do that are you some sort of idiot <laughs> that's basically going to make your palate taste of coffee and you've you've prepped it with a hot drink get get out the kitchen sit yourself down for 10 minutes then come to the tasting that's what i say yeah the time of day is fairly important or can be. Mornings are better, but not immediately after brushing your teeth or, or having that first cup of coffee. pre lunchtime, I think, has been proven to be when your palate's probably sort of primed, already had something for the day, and you're going to be sensitive still enough to, to, to get the best out of the tasting session. Um, the order in which you taste the samples is obviously very important. Let's say you're doing a tasting for Puri Puri Chicken. You've got a mild, you've got a medium, and then you've got an extra, extra, extra hot. I would hope it's fairly obvious to taste them in that order. But it will be obvious probably in that instance, but for other products, it might not be as obvious. And there's different ways you can go about it as well. I remember when at Green and Blacks, we used to do a lot of chocolate and wine pairing, and that was always a tricky one because ideally you would want to go savory to sweet, and then you would also want to go light flavors into yeah. more intense flavors and white wines into red wines. But because of the chocolates that pair with particular wines, you kind of had to compromise. And I think yeah. we always used to go from savory to sweet, but it did mean you potentially started. Yeah, we, more I mean, when I wines. used to work in wine and, and, you know, still drink quite a lot of wine, uh, we'd always start with, the, like you say, the white uh, and the lighter whites that are the more refreshing through to the more the heavier maybe chardonnays but white burgundies and then the reds maybe from pinot noirs through to sort of heavier roan or, or clarets or something like that but then last of all you'll go on to the sweet whites mm. because you're going dry to sweet so you've got to mix it up a bit yeah 
Yeah. But as long as you're just aware of that and also taste them in a particular order and don't be afraid to come back in another session and taste them in the opposite order because yeah. what you've tasted previously will impact how you perceive the next sample. That is how your palate works. That's why food and wine matching works because the food that you've just eaten is preparing your palate in a way mm. that you might That's perceive the wine certs- uh, uh, slightly differently. And it will make the, the, both the wine and the food taste different. Yeah. So if you have the, a bit of wine and then the food, then it will taste different. Then go back to the wine, the wine tastes different. And it, yeah, and that's why it's so important, well, for me to go to restaurants that have a decent wine list. Yeah. Or you can bring your own. Yes, you know. which we do. Um, we do, exactly. So um, I think the next thing that, is really important is having this systematic approach to tasting now i learned a lot about this when i was again going back to the wine industry we um we always used to obviously look at the wine first so it's the appearance you can get a lot of information about obviously things like the grape variety how um intense is how old it is how mature it is and then from the aroma and and from that you should get things like um you know the 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 great variety again the age uh also you know where that grape has been grown to a certain degree country maybe even region um and then and then taste which is there to confirm really what you've got on the appearance and the aroma in in wine it's so important yeah the, the appearance and the aroma and it doesn't mean that in any food or or drink product you were always going to be able to know everything no. from the appearance of the aroma but you're just pointing out why it's you shouldn't forget about appearance and no aroma. there's um, a lot that you can learn from just those first ex- senses exactly and, and recently we used it we uh, a product that we worked on that's recently been launched wednesday's domain mm. which is a non-alcoholic wine so i use my knowledge of tasting and my knowledge of wine and also my knowledge of how to develop a product to put together something that um sort of replicated wine as closely as it could do without having that alcohol in it and a lot of that is introducing these nuances which are tiny little sort of nuances of flavor um as well as things like the weight from glycerol and you know a bit of sweetness which doesn't actually taste sweet but gives a bit of weight to the product and things like that Another thing to consider is whether you should be tasting samples blind. It's not always necessary, but in some cases it's a good idea. Yeah, it's good, if, especially if you've got existing product development and you're changing like one attribute. Um, maybe it might be the sweetness or you might be changing a flavour supplier, something like that. So that's where you want to show whether there's any difference between two products. Yeah, and say. don't rely on, because if you're not tasting it blind... Your mind can play tricks on you. Exactly. The amount of times I've tasted something where I've made a change in the recipe and I think, oh, yeah, it's clearly obvious. I, I can really change the, taste that difference. We've gone too far. But then you do something called a triangle test and you figure out you, or you realize that you actually can't consistently pick out the change. So exactly. do you want to just tell us what a yeah. triangle test is? So a triangle test is where you essentially have two recipes. So um, you've got recipe one, recipe two. You take two samples from one of those and one sample from the other and you mix these up so let's say you do one with two recipe one and one sample of recipe two and let's let's say it's a cake project that you're working on and so recipe one is the standard recipe recipe two might be a 10 percent reduction in sugar to see if if you can do that without consumers tasting the difference so 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 maybe a number of reasons it might might be hfss it might Mm -hmm. be cost savings there are always different reasons but yes you might want to take out that sugar so you've got those two different recipes you give those in this triangle test to um, a number of people and you don't have the same something you'll give two of recipe one one of recipe two and the other half the opposite and you give them in different orders and let's say you have a minimum of around 30 because that's a good statistically significant number and then you give these to these people and what they've got to do is pick the odd one out that's all they've got to do nothing about what it tastes like just can you pick the odd one out and if they can if there's a statistically significant a number of people who can pick the odd one out then then they can tell the difference and you need yeah. to go back to the drawing board if they can't then you can say well actually it's passed the test yes absolutely okay so everything we've discussed here gives people a framework somewhere to start hopefully it gives them more confidence the next time they're going into a tasting session how to record the data once they've got that data once you've got your results what 
would you want to do next? So how, how can these results be used? So it really depends on who's doing this tasting. So if you and I are doing a tasting for anything that we're developing, then it's very much to, to understand how we can improve it, whether we've got far enough on that product when we, we can show it back to the client. But if, if we're doing it with, let's say, um, some uh, the marketing team or the sales team, then the marketing team, they can put it into a story. Mm. And, and that story, you know, will give them something that they can give clear feedback to the developers because they're now speaking the same sort of language or it might be uh, something they use to put on a packaging so uh, layperson's language to talk about the flavor or or something something on the back of pack to describe the product also though for the sales team it's really good to be able to communicate the competitive set and and to say how much better, hopefully, that your product tastes compared to mm. competitors. Mm. So they can go to a buyer, go to the customer and say, right, you should be buying this because I can. You, you, more people are likely to like this rather than the competitor. So yeah. lots. Another one I'd like to add is Taste Awards. So we've been fortunate enough to judge at awards like Great Taste, Academy of Chocolate. We've been on both sides of it, actually, yeah. submitting samples to these awards from Green and Blacks and then being judges at the awards as well. Funny enough, they never let me judge the green and black samples when I was I was judged. Yeah, I mean, the, you're the most objective man I know, so yeah, you'd exactly. no way you would score them that well. Absolutely not. But what I found there at these awards, you would have the judges, varying levels of training, expertise, different backgrounds, often very little in the side of taste mm. and uh, training, etc., and so you would have people almost hesitant to speak first and they would always go back to what was on the submission sheet with mm. the sample. And if a sample had a description of delicate notes of ginger with a background of lemongrass and cumin, if they could taste all of those things, they would say, oh, I taste the cumin and taste the lemongrass. So that's very good. And they would that would sort of favor positively in terms of how they scored the product. If they couldn't detect those points, then they would actually mark the product down, regardless of whether they actually thought it tasted nice or not. It was just people really relying on on what was written there. So I think being able to have the training to detect things and then using that language to tell the story, as you say, I've seen that be very useful when you're submitting samples to these awards. Yeah, that's a good point. We've covered quite a lot there. Yeah. I think we should quickly summarize we started with taste versus flavor hopefully some good insights there for people we then talked about how balancing these is so important to make food delicious and moorish if you're going into a tasting session have a plan take the time before the session to get everything in place that will help you get better results yeah help you with your confidence and then ultimately once you've got those results a couple of insights, ideas of what you can do with them. If people want to find out a little bit more about this subject following the episode, is there anywhere we can send them? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things. Firstly, there's a book that is a a US book, actually, by um, an author called Barb Stuckey. And it's about taste. It's called Taste, Surprising Stories and Science about why food tastes good. And it has a lot of what we've talked about, essentially, but it also has some exercises at the end of each chapter. So it's quite a good guide and something you might learn some more from. So that's a good thing. The other thing uh, that I strongly recommend is Mm. the WSET exams, the Wine and Spirit Education Trust. I did the diploma many, many years ago. We, we've got Gary, one of our development chefs. He's recently done it. You yeah. did it when I first met you. You, you bullied me into doing it because when I started working with you, like most chefs, if I'm honest, I didn't know very much about wine. You strongly suggest that I go and do the course. And yeah, I, I, did, I felt I didn't need to do level one. I think you can jump straight into yeah. level two. And I found it incredibly helpful. What I will say is that it means that my budget at home for wine has has increased since then so just be aware you go on these courses and all of a sudden the five pound bottles of wine don't really cut it they anymore. don't no a bit dangerous um, in that respect it's an addiction of mine is not not so much the drinking the wine but the spending of the money <laughs> on the wine but yes no a really good recommendation i think it's just uh, yeah just having that training 
and it gives confidence. Exactly. I think this is the thing that we want people to get out of this is to get people to be more confident in tasting. And once they have all this structure and, and they get the results as well, this is the thing is people then see that they, they're getting the results and they can say, ah, yes, I'm now good to do the next one. Yeah. Well, I think it's been a successful first episode. Hasn't Fingers taken crossed. too long. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, thank you, Micah. Looking forward to the next episode yeah. and more and diving into other topics. Um, Thanks yeah. to the listeners. Thank you. See you next time. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe. And for more information, please visit tastehead.com. We hope you join us for our next episode.